Support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. The Carolinas are ostensibly getting more center stage attention in global political consciousness. Leadership like Nikki Haley, Mick Mulvaney, have found their way into international and national leadership. North Carolina's House Bill 2, immigration, and deciding on how to best tackle two of this country's largest system of roads and infrastructure are all meaningful issues with timely outcomes. Thank you again and welcome to the most widely watched source of business and public policy here in the Carolinas. There is much to distill and chat about. Joining our dialogue later is one of North Carolina's key politicos and especially in and around what has become the Tar Heel State's bathroom bill. Charlotte Mayor Jennifer Roberts. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Otis Rawl from the Greater Lexington Chamber and Visitor Center, Neil Robbins of the North State Journal, and special guest, Mayor Jennifer Roberts of the City of Charlotte. Welcome to our program, Odie, good to have you back. Neil, welcome. Glad Thanks for having me. Back. Thank you. Uh, Otis, I'm going to start with a question where, you know, we, we talk about issues like health care and Medicaid and transportation and education. Uh, but this may be one of those sleeper issues we had not thought about a lot. And, and, and Donald Trump, one of Donald Trump's initiatives is to spend 50 plus billion dollars additionally on military and on national defense. Well, when you think about the Carolinas, North and South Carolina have uh, a pretty deep roots when it comes to military bases. Could this be a boon for the Carolinas? I think so in that uh, if you look over the last 10 or 15 years when you're looking at BRAC closures and things of that sort, I think it's given a lot of hope to uh, the military in South Carolina that we may not be facing some losses in types of jobs and different types of segments that are at Fort Jackson, mm -hmm. maybe even at Shaw. So we're looking at this as really kind of an incentive play by uh, the national government and also to be able to keep those types of jobs uh, in, in and around Columbia. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar deal for us in the Midlands, and I think it probably the same way up at Fayetteville with, with the type of facilities they've got there. So I, I, I think it's going to bring a lot of relief to the military community and possibly a lot of relief to the business communities who surround those military communities. Neil, has North State Journal done any work on this yet, pro projecting out how this might fall out? We, 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 we cover the military um, as part of the business of North Carolina. Uh, the military is the second largest industry in our state, and North Carolina has home to one of the largest military bases in the world in Fort Bragg, and certainly Eastern North Carolina um, goes as the military goes. And when the military comes, they invest in infrastructure. And as we know, infrastructure is key to economic development. And so those, um, the, the rail car infrastructure, the railroad infrastructure that, uh, that comes with the military mm -hmm. is so important for Eastern North Carolina. So I think a, a $50 billion uh, in total spending from the military or increase would be great for North Carolina. So you brought up a good point. Infrastructure, yeah, that certainly is one of job one or job two at least. Both session, both General Assemblies in session right now talking things like infrastructure, transportation, education. Uh, Odie, uh, South Carolina, uh, you know, there's not a more tender issue right now than fixing roads and bridges right. and getting the infrastructure financed and done. 
Uh, will that happen? There's a 10 cent sales tax that's being knocked around in the House and the Senate. Looks right. like it has the support in different verbiage. Uh, will it, when it gets to McMaster's desk, will he sign it? And will there actually be an increase in the ga gas tax? I think you go see an increase uh, in the gas tax. The whole $600 million funding plan that they've got is something that the business community has been talking about for 10 years, Chris. And we've got a $1 billion need per year just to bring our roads back up to standards. It's almost embarrassing for me to be a South Carolinian and talk about roads, particularly when you enter South Carolina from either North Carolina and Georgia and just see what poor shape our interstates and, and our roads are in. I do think Henry would, uh, would, would be well served to sign the bill. Uh, if you look at the numbers in South Carolina, 70 percent of the people favor some type of increased funding for roads. And I think he said uh, uh, firsthand that it, it will only approve a tax increase as a last resort. Well, it's a last resort. We've taken more money out of the general fund than we can really afford if we could continue to fund public education and some of the other areas of, of the state that needs help. Uh, we're at a last resort. So the business community is going to be encouraging our Senate now to pass the bill that the House uh, passed with the $600 million and encourage uh, Governor McMaster to sign the bill. And I think that he's a lot different than the previous governor. I think he's been part of the party for a long time, so he understands all the different pieces of the party. So uh, I, I think Henry would be better, best served to sign the bill and say, we did something great for South Carolina. Neil, what do you think? Well, I mean, infrastructure is is key, and uh, I just joined the law firm Nex and Pruitt in, uh, in North Carolina, but they have a, lot, a big South Carolina presence, so I've been down to Columbia a few times. And it is noticeable when you cross mm -hmm. the North Carolina, South Carolina line, the difference in um, in the roads. And it's also different in the conversations that you right. have when you get there about the roads. Um, we don't hear it as much in North Carolina, but I think it, uh, we've certainly had conversations and I think your next guest will probably uh, yeah. talk about uh, I-77 and how we deal with those roads. But as, uh, as the publisher of the only statewide newspaper in North Carolina, I spend a lot of time on the mm -hmm. road. Um, I might find myself in Charlotte or Raleigh, but I'm just as likely to have dinner in Wilmington and breakfast in Asheville. So I spend a lot of time on mm -hmm. our roads. North Carolina has good roads. Um, we're known as the great road state, but I think we can we can do better. Um, but from an infrastructure standpoint, another thing we need to focus on is a, a less visible, but just as important in broadband. And I think there's a good conversation going on in the legislature right now about how we get that last mile done of high speed internet. And we're seeing entrepreneurs in North Carolina locating in rural areas or smaller towns because they have invested in broadband and they can do their work from anywhere. And they don't necessarily just have to be in Raleigh or Charlotte to get that broadband access. Well, well, let me take it to healthcare. Healthcare, right. Medicaid expansion has been all, one of those, one, one of those, I'm mm -hmm. not going to call it a boondoggle, but it's been, it's been kind of the third rail. I mean, the general assemblies don't want to take it for, for, for the reasons that they spell out. I mean, couple things. So, Odie, in South Carolina, do you feel like the new governor is going to be more sympathetic toward at least considering about supporting a Medicaid expansion plan? I don't know. I, I, I personally, I think politically they go wait to see what Washington does with with the Affordable Health Care Act. Is that the but coverage now that's, everyone's going to say? That's the coverage that everybody's gonna, looking at. They yeah. go say, let's see what happens in Washington before we decide what we're going to do. Uh, if, if the Affordable Health Care Act stays where it is, we've got probably about a $100 million issue in South Carolina we got to address and how we fund different things and all. But very much like uh, Governor Haley, I think our General Assembly says hands off. We've been a hands off state. We uh, did not participate in uh, receiving the money from the federal government. So I, I really believe we go take a back seat and just look and listen for the next year, and it might not happen this session if Washington doesn't do something in the next couple mm -hmm. of months uh, with the Affordable Health Care Act. So Roy Cooper has released his bill, or, I'm sorry, his budget recently, mm -hmm. as, you, uh, as you have seen, Neil. Uh, anything surprising in there? Anything where you say, yeah, uh, that's going to work, it's not going to work, given what you know about the General Assembly we've had in place now? Well, I think uh, you know the, the political currents are certainly not going to favor Medicaid expansion that's because right. of the uncertainty. I think businesses, um, whether they like a regulation or they like a law or not, they favor certainty. And, uh, and, and, and unfunded mandates certainly create a lot of uncertainty with Medicaid expansion. So I think that's going to be, it's not a surprising inclusion in the governor's budget, but I think that that's, um, that's certainly one that um, didn't surprise me, but 
I, I don't I don't see the the currents favoring that. Uh, uh, one surprise is a, a big investment in, in uh, fighting the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, North Carolina's got a big problem in that. A lot of the Appalachian states do. Um, I would not be surprised to see some bipartisan support for something like that. Really, even given the 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 pretty acrimonious debate around transportation and education. You think something like that could rise to the top and get the funding? You know, I see, and it's, it's, I don't think it's going to be a big budget line, yeah. um, but I think it's just, you know, you try to find those little points where you think there might be bipartisan support. And I think back to the, the hemp oil um, medicine, medicinal yeah. uh, stuff that did get some bipartisan support previously, because you see those rural communities are getting affected by the yeah. opioid crisis, and they've got to do something about it. Uh, and it reaches from Murphy to Manio, it reaches from New Hanover County all the way to Buncombe County. Yeah. Um, so I think that that could be something that might you might surprise you that there might be some bipartisan support for. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing too, Chris, going back to South Carolina budget, you know, we've got to an uh, answer the questions about what's considered a, uh, a, a good education funding mechanism for our public schools. Our Supreme Court has told our General Assembly that they've got to provide money for an adequate education. So they've kind of gone past that for two years. I think this is the year that they've got to deal with that from a budgetary standpoint. Well, I was going to say, Otis, that the Supreme Court's been trying yep. to compel the state to do yep. something about that for a while. Do you, th you think 2017 is going to be the year? I think so, particularly yeah. in light of uh, taking the revenue and finding another revenue source for roads and all, it leaves some additional funding in the general fund now for them to begin to start yeah. answering that question. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, stay with us. And thanks for the segue, because talk about education. Next week on this program, uh, the president, the new president of the South Carolina Technical College System, his name is Tim Hardy, and he uh, ran the Sumter Technical College for a while, and now he is running the statewide system. Uh, takes over after Jimmy Williamson took the job to run the community college system in North Carolina. And then in two weeks, or or in just a few weeks, he is uh, head of one of the nation's, certainly the Carolina's largest health care provider. Gene Woods will be on our program, president of Carolina's health care system. He is also the incoming president of the American Hospital Association, which is a big job in itself. We will be talking to Gene Woods about many things around health care and growth and development. You know, so much dialogue and air in the room, so to speak, has been about North Carolina's House Bill 2. Not to minimize or undermine what it may mean to different people and different constituents, but how much attention is lost on issues like immigration, community development, infrastructure, social services, et cetera, et cetera, because of the sheer gravitational pull of emotion around this issue for so long. Well, it seems this issue begins in large part after Charlotte City Council passed a non-discrimination uh, non ordinance in February of last year. That presiding mayor joins us now, the Honorable Jennifer Roberts. Uh, Your Honor, welcome to the program. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Uh, so, uh, Your Honor, I, I think about, and I, and I promise we're not going to talk about HB2 continuously, but it, it, it is an issue. And when you enter into the fall race and to run for re-election, and you've seen what happened with a governor of North Carolina, how this thing was hung around his neck and ended up being maybe one of the things that caused him not to get re-elected. Are you concerned for yourself in this election? Well, I think what people need to remember is that this was all about equality. It was all about having Charlotte be competitive on the global stage and being a place that welcomes everyone, that includes everyone. And look, we have tourism as a huge part of our economy. We want to make sure that we are treating mm -hmm. everybody equally, that we are saying everybody is welcome. And I think people know that that's Charlotte's brand. Um, we would not have wished to be in the national stage the way we've been for that reason. But remember, it is about equality. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is basic. You know, the high-tech industries especially understand that. They have talent that comes in all shapes and sizes. They want to attract talent. They want to retain talent. They want to be in an environment that's friendly to creativity, innovation, and everybody being at the table. How, speaking of that, how would you handicap House Bill, North Carolina House Bill 186 uh, in, in being successful at bringing everyone back to the table and finding a solution and, and, and finding a solution to what has really divided the state over a while now? Well, I've, I've said that nothing short of a full repeal would really do that in terms of removing the cloud yeah. that's over our state and our reputation because there are still pieces in 186 that discriminate. Uh, and when you put civil rights up for a, a popular vote, 
um, that is not a way to instill confidence in the fact that you stand behind equality and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Odie. Mayor, thank you. First, it's nice yeah. meeting you. Uh, from a South Carolina perspective, uh, Charlotte's continuing to grow toward South, South Carolina's border. And we were talking about light rail ahead of the show and the amount of money that's being spent or anticipated being spent by Charlotte on light rail. What type of collaboration efforts do you see that we as South Carolinians need to have with Charlotte and your, your business leaders to really look at a cross-line funding that will handle traffic and congestion problems going not only east and west but north and south along 77 as more and more uh, people live in South Carolina and work in Charlotte? Well, I tell you, we're really fortunate to have our regional partnership because that includes four counties in South mm -hmm. Carolina. And they have been doing great work. Their board, um, you know, they meet regularly and talk about those kinds of issues. Our transportation folks talk to South Carolina all the time, you know, because 77 widening from Charlotte South is going to be um, on the table pretty soon. And uh, I hear from people in South Carolina who really want to be part of our light rail system. Yep. Uh, absolutely. To grow that system, we are going to need to look regionally. And we're going to need to look across state lines, across county lines. How do we work together to fund it? We already have plans for three more lines. They're going to be extending uh, to the edge of the county. But you look at transit systems around the country, and there are many of them that are multi-county. You know, we are in that unique position in Charlotte, being 15 miles from the South Carolina border, where we have a lot of folks who live one place, work the other, and cross that state line every day. We absolutely need to be working together, and I think we have good infrastructure to have that conversation really go. Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you, I think it's a, a, a great standard for other South Carolina cities to, to look and, and the success that y'all gonna have will go feed into the Charleston area that faces a lot of the same issues and in and around the Midlands and Columbia and all. So what y'all do here is gonna be really looked upon as a standard barrier for how we handle public and mass transportation in South Carolina and some of our other cities. You know, another thing that we share is our airport. Right. We get a lot of folks from you know, Rock Hill, Fort Mill, et cetera, using our airport. And one of the things that I've tried to do is really see that as a regional asset. And so we have a regional mayor's group that I invited to go and tour the airport, get the behind the scenes right. tour. We want everyone to feel like it's their airport, that they have input, and that it's, it's serving them. And we wanted them to be able to see the timeline of growth um, and I had to tell folks that the orange cones are not going away for a while. <laughs> Neil, go ahead. Um, being from Asheboro, um, always uh, been a visitor to Charlotte for, for different things, events and that kind of thing. But I think with HB2, you've got an awareness of Charlotte from Murphy to Manio that probably has not been, been seen uh, ever. Um, so kind of, we've not gotten to the point where as Charlotte goes, so too goes North Carolina, but we certainly seen that things that happen in Charlotte have a ripple effect across our whole state. But I'd like to look more locally. Um, how do you collaborate with Mecklenburg County as a, as a mayor of a huge metro area that people I think identify more as Charlotte than they do Mecklenburg County? What's the interplay when you're making leadership decisions that not only affect inside your borders, the people that vote for you for mayor, but also the rest of those people that live in Mecklenburg County? Well, I tell you, it's great that we have things like the Central Atlanta Council of Governments because there are commissioners and city council members and mayors that are part of that organization. And there are issues that are cross-cutting. You know, we have uh, defined issues on infrastructure that really apply to cities and then health and human services that apply to counties. But all those things work together. And so it is absolutely essential for us to be in communication. Charlotte wants to be a healthy city. So we're building the infrastructure to help do that in terms of walkable, bikeable communities. We even have a cross Charlotte trail. But we have to be talking to the health department about, you know, what else do we do to keep people from having diabetes, to keep people from chronic illnesses? Where are those health clinics? Where is the access that we're going to have? Transportation connects people from their homes to their workplaces and to their medical facilities. So again, uh, CDOT and CATS and all our transportation folks need to be aware of those other aspects of government. So, you know, we have a lot of informal conversations. I talk to the county commission. I talk to the county manager. Uh, I also, as a former commissioner, I know a lot of the department heads, especially Park and Rec, my favorite department. <coughs> and we're going to continue those conversations. We have to recognize there are cross-cutting issues that impact all of us. Yeah, so let, let me bring this back to this. And something you started with here, this whole department of transportation and the infrastructure thing, Mayor, 
So you've got the triangle that has been battling with this idea of the orange line and a plan to connect, of course, Durham, Raleigh, Chapel Hill and RTP. You've got Charlotte that's laid out now, this six plus billion dollar vision. Why is it so hard to have to have a vision be more broadly adopted when it does make sense and you're leaning into the growth of a region? Why is that so hard? Is it because it's such a big investment number to begin with? I think people have some sticker shock when they see $6 billion. Uh, but you know, you look at some place like Washington, D.C., one line out to Dallas Airport is about $6 billion. So we're looking at three lines. But I think as people continue to use the blue line and as that new extension opens, as we build out our streetcar and people see the connectivity and also that it goes beyond transportation, it's also all about land use planning. And so if you want to have density of development where you can have multifamily apartments and condos along a, right, a light rail line, then you can save green space that's further away from those transit corridors. You can still have your parks. You can still have industrial sites. And so I think that when people look at it for land use planning and recognize the value it brings to those areas along that line uh, and also the transportation it provides, uh, especially rail, people like a fixed line. They know they can invest mm -hmm. there. They know it's going to be there for a long time. It's different than a bus line. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what's happening in Charlotte, that's really clear that that's, that's mm -hmm. what's going on. Odie, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, you. No, uh, Mayor, I was just, you know, doing a little research behind what, you're, what is big for you. And we're talking about entrepreneurship and innovation and technology. And we know that the millenniums and the Gen Xs are looking for cheap places to live. So. It's, what is your vision for Charlotte and how do you get there when you start talking about competing against cities like uh, San Francisco, Seattle, and even Charleston, South Carolina as cheap places to live? What do you see, Charlotte, what do you see as your vision to make Charlotte one of those places where yeah. the, the Millenniums and Gen Xs want to come and live and work? Well, you know, we have over 100 people a day moving to the Charlotte region. Half of them are under age 35. So we are attracting those millennials, and we are focusing on making Charlotte a hub of innovation, technology, creativity, and we can do that because we have a great university. UNC Charlotte has a great informatics and big data area. They've got the Portal Building, which is the business incubator. Uh, we have about 15 incubators in the Charlotte area, um, by the way, but we can continue to focus on that um, and let people know that um, Charlotte accepts innovation. We have a great arts community. We have a number of small nonprofits working with startups and incubators. We're actually planning um, a trip to New York to talk to venture capitalists and equity investors about coming to Charlotte because we have that amazing energy that it takes. And what we find is some of the folks um, who can't afford to live in LA or the Bay Area who want to start a company, you know, they're 30, they were working at Google, they want to start their own company, they can't afford to live in the Bay Area, they can afford to live in Charlotte. And the other thing that we have is a competitive advantage, we have financial services. We have so many folks who've been in banking or insurance or something related to financial services, that's essential for tech startups. Um, it's also for FinTech, a lot of these new companies are around payments processing and different apps like that. So. We have that over Austin, and I will say that we can compete with any of those up-and-coming cities uh, because of all the great resources and the great people we have here. Yeah, we have about a minute left. Can you do it? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, President Trump's focus, obviously, is um, kind of domestic growth, and we're seeing some international companies who are maybe crying uncle after a tweet storm, or, uh, or maybe they're just making strategic investment in, in America. But is now the time, at least I'm hearing from Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, that now's the time to bring some of those international companies to North Carolina. Do you think that, that it's the time to, to recruit those? And, and, and if, you, if you do, are you, are you going after them? Well, I clearly think it's the time because I'm going to China next week. <laughs> and we have a whole delegation going on a trade mission to China. We've seen Chinese companies grow from five to 40. We now have 40 Chinese-owned companies in Charlotte. Um, that's over the last five years. And so we have over a thousand foreign-owned firms in the Charlotte region. 
we are going to continue to grow that. We know that the dollar is still strong, that people believe in the American economy. Um, there's some turbulence in some of the markets overseas. Mayor, we want to continue to recruit, and Mayor, we're going to do that. I, I, hey, I can't give you a university professor a chance to answer that, but thank you for being <laughs> on the program. Good, good job. Safe travels to China thank and you beyond. Much. Neil, good to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, Otis, always nice to have you. Good thank to see you. you. Until next week, I'm Chris William. I hope your weekend is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit CarolinaBusinessReview.org.